They're eight by 12, Port Orford Cedar, 18 and 20 feet long. And his rack is stacked full of them. They're hanging over four and aft, wow. about 900 pounds worth up there. Hmm. Nice wood. A couple of them are free of heart center, yeah. tight grain. And then he's got this trailer just jammed. I think <laughs> this guy appreciates <laughs> wood. He's not so afraid. Cool. <laughs> he's not afraid to strike out on his own to get some at home, man. Welcome to the Essential Craftsman Podcast. I'm Nate, and we have got Jason Fox with us today. Jason is a part of Never Stop Building, which is a YouTube channel. He is a carpenter and craftsman and builder with almost an unbelievable uh, range of expertise and interests and hobbies. And we talk about building hot tubs. We talk about Japanese carpentry and building techniques and culture to a certain extent. We talk about lumber and wood species and just generally about craftsmanship. And we're very lucky to have my dad, the essential craftsman, with us here. And I think you're really going to enjoy this. This is um, this is what it's all about, is talking to these people who are actively building and making things. And Jason just embodies that um, in everything he does. So uh, without any further ado, Jason Fox. I think the first thing to talk about, just because it's fresh in my mind, is the hot tub. And yeah. the way to talk about it, initially, I, I've seen people with like, you know, little wood-fired hot tubs and DIY home-built ones that are, they look pretty neat. And I got to admit, I've kind of thought, man, that'd be kind of fun to do someday. So as someone who has done it to the max, uh, well, what do you say when people say like, I'm thinking about building a hot tub? A well, wood-fired one. Or any kind. Well, Your, I was, wanted to do that. I mean, because I love woodworking so much. I was trying to sell my friend on, yeah, let's build, let's build a round cedar hot tub. Yeah. You know, we can still put a heater in it. And he was worried about the maintenance. Yeah. And uh, his house is a very strange house. It's all hexagonal designed. But, so uh, the hot tub had to be a hexagon. Yes. It had, <laughs> you know, there was a, there was a secluded back deck and we could make a hexagon that would match the angles of the house. So yeah. that's, that's how that design came out. And what, how's it, how's it heated? Like a like a gas furnace, the kind of thing. Uh, all, all he has is propane. So we we have a, a electric. It's eighty amps, so it's two forty amp breakers. Okay. Uh, there's a whole pump house, which yeah, you built. Yeah, there's a, there's a whole separate bunch of videos on that. Um, we have a little trouble with the heater. We have to replace <laughs> still, it a couple still times. Still working on it. There's a <laughs> there's so few companies that make, um, hot tub pool heaters that are electric because of the, mm. the current draw yeah, so big draw uh there's weird corrosion issues and stuff like yeah. that i won't yeah. mention the name so the does it <laughs> does it make sense at all uh, in this case because you needed a specific design but you can buy hot tubs for a few thousand bucks i've been reminded does by... it does it make sense to <laughs> build them uh, still or well, what do you think it, i think this was very specific aesthetic yeah he wanted a hexagon he, we, he had a tiles from a hotel that he had his honeymoon in and it was like there's like it's like built into the hill it's built side. into the hill the the pump house matches the house yeah if you just want to get warm yeah they even have nice wood kits yeah that and you can heat them however you want yeah 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 but i'm the kind of person so so like, so draw me a little picture here what kind of joinery what what's the deal tell me describe i haven't seen this he's seen it you've seen it tell me describe it to me and the hot tub yeah yeah what's it like uh okay so it's there's a there's a big hill there's a, it's a, it was like a monopore concrete. All the forms were built in place, mm -hmm. rebarred. All the plumbing was built in. It's two hexagons that, ha that once there's a seat. Oh, so it's a con it's concrete. Yeah. It's oh, a, it, I was visualizing that this was wood joinery and it was no, a redwood no, no, or something. No. This okay. Is, this is, this was a, okay. I got to pay the bills. My friend needs okay. a hot tub. Okay. Gotcha. Yeah. All right. I'm up to speed now. Yeah. Now I'm worried because you're going to, you're going to watch these videos about my concreting and you're going to be, <laughs> oh, like, oh no, for it's a fine. pool, it's great because you just tie all over it. So, I mean, yeah. which is beautiful. Uh, yeah. And, but, but there's, I guess I was so worried about the, it could be like crack, you know, it's, you know, will the rebar hold it together? Will the membrane work? Yeah. There's all this, yeah. a lot of, a lot of learning as doing. Yeah. And, yeah. But combining other stuff that I yeah. knew about. Yeah. Oh. Anytime you make a concrete vessel that you want to hold water, it's a nail biter. Yes. I, I, I built a pool for a guy. Yeah. 20 by 40, four feet to 10 feet deep on a 35% hillside. Hmm. Okay. So when you're standing on the edge of the deck at the deep end, you're standing out on a cantilevered deck 
looking down a long ways and your toes are 16 feet off the ground and eight feet behind you, there's a 10 foot deep <laughs> pool. So I can relate to and how much to hold we, water and it had to hold water like yeah. for a long time. So how, how was that one? What was the membrane on that? It was plastered. It's a plastered. It's a oh. shot crete. Okay. <laughs> it, it's a gunite plastered traditional pool. But yours is tile all the way around, which yeah. there's yes. still probably a separate sort of barrier there. Yeah. Right? This company Laticrete makes oh, yeah. very expensive chemicals you have to mix together. Yeah. Mm. yeah a, a kind of a latex that yeah. you roll on. And the, the tiles are glass too. I mean, oh I, I decided to just all the way. jump right in the deep end. Yeah. Glass tile I will never do again. I will hire somebody. I, will, I mean, wow. tile alone, but yeah, glass tile. I have tile no is, idea how to handle glass tile. Well, not only is you have to use those special products because of the flexibility and the brittleness or something, but uh, cutting it is a pain. Oh, yeah. This is semi-translucent, so you have to have your your grout or your uh, your thin set perfectly mm. done so when you compress it. You, see, you can see, don't have to see voids under there. Yeah, you can have solid there's backing. There's a couple of voids. <laughs> don't, don't, <laughs> but uh, it's pretty much, it's pretty dialed in. Wow, that is too cool. And Oh, and then... Uh, you filmed the whole thing, which yeah. as we yeah. know, yeah. is kind of like doing the project twice, even while you're filming it somehow, it's like adding a ton. And, and so oh, yeah. what was that like? Well, many parts were just stop motion mm -hmm. and, and I was doing a video series and it's, it's like, it's like you've talked about it. It's this love hate relationship with, okay, I just, I need, I need to get this done. But then yeah. you're like, well, okay, I might as well set the camera up. Got to capture it. But then you're like, well, now I'm working over here for three hours. Okay, now I got to move the camera. And mm -hmm. Yeah. But yeah. some of the shots, there's a shot where it like spins around yeah. was fun. How did it do that? So I 3D printed a like uh, a reducer. I got a servo and a little controller and and basically built this whole 3D printed thing. There's, I think there's a video about that. Okay. And a long armature, like a selfie stick. Really? So when you dialed it, it would spin once in like eight hours so oh, while i was nice. tiling he was following me around the phil roca's trick there. that's unbelievable i mean yeah those shots are cool i when you have like there's lots of little like things where the camera slides this yeah. way or, the funny thing you i'm tuned to this now but you kind of mentioned so casually i 3d printed this and added a servo <laughs> which brings in like three separate yeah whole complex <laughs> can of worms yeah yeah and that's just to get the 3d shot so yeah. Um, I think we're talking to like, a, he's another zealot. Uh, yeah. A, a real like king of all trades. Yeah. Like yeah. Uh, yeah. Well, I try. <laughs> you got to, you got to talk to Phil. Yeah. Phil hacks, Phil bought, would buy GoPros when GoPros were fresh and he would buy other gimbals to hang the GoPro from and he would rig them and then he would hack into the GoPro so that he could operate the oh, GoPro nice. shutter and video component from the remote control that he had hacked into <laughs> from remote air aircraft flying and then he would build the drone that he would hang all this off of by the motors by the props That's by awesome. the frame so you and Phil would have a lot. And to now talk you about. can buy that in a drone for like three hundred bucks. Yeah, that's does right. It all perfect. And the price is falling. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Well, it's it's like very much like. I want to do this thing. Like, how do I solve this problem? Let me just yeah. break it down, break it down, break it down. Yeah, that's awesome. That's pretty neat, though. The selfie sticks. I, I, I was envisioning like a little track. I, I, it just didn't occur to me um, that that little engineering trick. But yeah, just spin of course. Over. And I had the superstructure because so this is Colorado, and you can't have a job site. Yeah, uncovered. Exposed. Yeah, because it's like oh, there's ten ten inches of snow, yeah. and it was sunny yesterday, so. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I built like a really poorly made tarp tent kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and then hung it from there in the middle. I love seeing guys in Colorado or anywhere in the North, like working on their boats over the winter or yeah. building swimming pools. It's, it's like a, a type of foresight that moderate climate people don't, I don't know, deal, don't go to, you know, because it's not <laughs> so cold, but man, it's amazing. You guys will just like building a hot tub, although I guess that's a wintertime well, yeah, thing I mean, anyway. We but, had this crazy cold snap that the whole yeah. country had, and it was negative 10, but then that weekend, t-shirt, well, yeah. sunny, everything melted out. I know, right? So um, tell us about, and I don't know the right way to get into this, but you're the first guy who could even speak to it at all. And that's the, the whole, the Japanese woodworking, uh, I don't know, it's, a, it's not a style, it's more than a style, it's just a, 
So we got this what, mystique what over here, Japanese woodworking. Yeah. Nobody does it like the Japanese. But it's a real thing. It's not a myth. And every time I see it, I, I, I'm like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't. Can you talk about that? Like, what? So, how, explain how you kind of got interested in it, and maybe sure. paint the, give us the background, and then we'll get to the nitty gritty. Okay. Well, the the brief background, as I understand it, is there's there were several people in the '70s that were able to get apprenticeships. And a couple, couple of these people I, I, I know, a couple are friends of friends, a couple I don't know, like Len Brackett is, is a famous one. Um, they got their training in Japan and then they sort of brought it back in and mixed it in with uh, some, a, lot of, a lot of movements that were going on in the 70s, you know, different building styles and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. And But there's still only maybe, you know, 100 people that, that do it professionally. There's meetups and stuff and, and whatnot. Um, I've always been interested in uh, Japanese culture from early on, you know, a kid growing up in Maryland, yeah, playing video games and anime, sushi, and I don't know where it comes from. You sort of discover that you like to build stuff. And then I was telling Scott earlier that I had been doing some electronics consulting and, and software stuff and was kind of like, bur- I guess you could say burnt out. It was uh, just computer work all the time, stressful. You know, it's good money, but I was just in front of the computer prototyping all the time. I was like, man, I, sh- I should just I should take a vacation for myself and do one of these timber framing classes. And- That's the thing, I guess. The, generally speaking, the Japanese woodworking is a timber framing like family of yeah, but it it's the mystique is born of of its foreignness. I yeah. think like it when having trained in Japan, it's just carpentry in Japan, like the and and i'm sure this is going to get there's a lot of opinions on this i'm sure but they are trying to make a living and they have a series of techniques born of a long tradition um the stuff i was doing was very boutique in the same way that a european timber frame company or a u.s timber frame company would be doing Mm -hmm. old style houses for kind of high-end clients Mm. but we would also we also did renovation work at a couple places and in Japan, yeah, mm-hmm. uh, there was a really nice lady that had a little bed and breakfast, and we were on a budget redoing a, an old house on her property to make a new guest house. And uh, it was a lot of similar techniques we use here, but kind of born of their style and the materials they had available. So, so, so that's part of what intrigues us is that number one, when you look at it, the shapes are foreign. Mm. You know, the shapes and the proportions, and they're foreign, but they're elegant. There's something about Japanese architecture and Japanese jewelry and you name it. Anything Japanese that's in the countryside, yeah, you know, just looks like it grew straight out of the earth exactly like that and couldn't have grown any other way. Yeah. And so there's that element, the shapes, you know. And then the next element is the joinery itself. They're not, the, the, more, the little bit that I have focused my attention on it, the mortise and the tenon and the and the lap joints and the scarf joints and and the different ways that the wood is connected is just subtly different yeah. than what we think of from you know German timber frame or or the green and green mm-hmm. style although they brought in some Japanese elements so can you speak to that about how it's what jumped out at you as being wow this is something other than what I've gotten my hands on before well it's so much of their joinery is born from the well, it's an island. It's very that what what's there is what you get. So yeah. they got a lot of earthquakes. It's very impermanent, huh. and a lot of that's born from really strong, flexible wood structures where there's no fasteners to, um, like move differently from the wood itself. Um, a lot of stuff that you don't see a lot here are the scarf joints mm-hmm. joining long timbers together. They have very intricate ones. Um, They've been maintaining temples for thousands of years, so there's a whole set of joinery devoted to in-place work. Mm. So, like, and and I'm using one on a on a renovation I'm doing right now, where it's an old pole barn that we're putting in a like an apartment above it, and they have the the center poles are are cut halfway through. Like, I don't, I don't. They just sistered two boards on either side. So, but we're going to jack the roof up and scarf it in. And there's a scarf joint where you only have to jack the roof up about 15 millimeters or half inch or so. And you slide it in, it locks in place mm. and then drop the roof back down. So it, it's a way to add a, a length enough, a post without 
changing the existing structure. Mm. Um, Did you know that existed before you were in Japan? Not not those types of joints. Mm -hmm. I had studied it quite a bit and took classes and stuff like that, but but the whole field of main, maintaining buildings and, mm -hmm. and those type of things and furniture and so so following up, um, is there a different set of protocols for the work that's done on their temples, or is it just the same work that would be done on a on a farmer's outbuilding or uh, a, a residence in Tokyo, or is there is there sort of a craft unto itself devoted to the it's Shinto, right? Uh, well, they have Shinto shrines and Buddhist temples. There's okay. like a dual. And, but it's just one set of carpenters doing one type of woodwork in all the buildings to, to whatever the architecture oh, it's, is. It's extremely stratified. You have um, temple carpenters. Okay, that's what I'm wondering. And you have door makers. You have... So there, there's sort of like the general carpenter contractor uh -huh. thing um, and in various levels of uh, you know expertise. There's uh, what they call pre-cut, which is probably close to, it's somewhere between our stick frame and a timber frame. Uh -huh. It's all CNC cut, put together with bolts and fasteners. Kind of like Europe does sometimes. Yes. Okay. And uh, that's wild to work on because you have teams of small carpenters come together to do one because you need extra people. And as fast as the crane brings in the piece, like, like fast. Bam. You are jumping around. There's no safety belts, no scaffolding. I mean, there's a little bit of scaffolding. But production. Yeah, running, putting bolts in. The next one's flying over your head. Wow. People are yelling at so you. So they, they build that way because it's fast and because that's like their production method yeah. to build buildings quickly. And there's also, then there's like sort of another level down called, uh, they, they call it like homemaker, where it's it's like the mail order catalog house. Oh. It's uh, e even more formulaic, more... Um, like a kit. Yeah, like a kit. Do it yourself. Yeah, and so there's there's all sorts of like weird cultural groups of people. Like there's the the homemaker carpenters are kind of like rough and tumble, not super skilled. Uh -huh. Put together a kit. They get drunk every night. Uh -huh. Peace workers. Here. Yeah, yeah. So, but but then yeah, like the highest end is is the temple carpenters, and that's pretty close to still guild level kind of really? stuff. I mean, there's long apprenticeships, lineages. So how, why is it, it's probably the same thing in Europe, but lots of these old buildings, the craftsmanship was so high and so good. And like, even on, I'm thinking like a Japanese roof where it mm. rolls up. I don't know what that's called, but. Yeah, what's that called? <laughs> Sorry. On the spot. Uh, I, I don't know. That, that's fine. It's, yeah. called, it's called a Japanese roll up. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah I'm sure. Yeah. yeah. So, so I'm, I'm, I could, I am definitely not the expert <laughs> but my point on is any of this. That takes a ton of extra work and labor and skill and all that. And how is it that. 100 years ago or two or 500 years ago, they had the time to do that yeah. as opposed to like growing food or, well, you know what I mean? Like, I mean, think of the cathedrals in like Europe though, or like our, we have a couple churches or even our government buildings. I mean, yeah. the yeah. money was there and and the, re the religion was as important in in that history and now it's like cultural icons. So. Okay, so it was the like premium structures yeah, that this, this got has that, to be. that level of craftsmanship and everybody else lived in huts or something yeah and i think there's some beauty to the stuff you see in the countryside because it's you know it's in their forms yes. so it's somewhat foreign and that aesthetic is cool but it's rough too like mm. you know a, a, a woodshed or something just you know un, undone logs spiked together with metal roofing uh, survival counts yeah right survival counts even in japan yeah apparently yeah that's part of what can be missed though it's like almost like social media where you see pictures of a person or something and you're like oh that's their life that's that's the avatar of that person's existence when it's kind of like no that's the best moment of their entire yeah, year yeah. photoshop photoshop exactly and that they carefully delivered you know as a and so like with some of these buildings it's like that's real and it exists but that's not to say that every japanese family you know goes home and cooks dinner not <laughs> in a house all. built to that level of skill yeah there, there's weird trends like uh Old houses, there was periods like, you know, I, I don't know if you see this over here in, in Oregon, but at least in Colorado and definitely the East Coast, I guess 70s, 80s, they like put carpet over everything. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like in the bathroom. Even. Yeah. That, yeah. I just tore carpet out of the bathroom. Yeah, that's pretty crazy. But the same thing kind of happened in Japan where they put concrete enclosures around the bottoms of these old houses. And the mm -hmm. whole point of that style is to lift the house off the ground 
and get the air moving through. Oh, they rotted them off. Yeah. So we we did some ha- work on houses where it was like the 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 ceiling and the structure was in decent shape, but the underfloor was gone. Wow. But then you have a house like a like a pretty run down. Uh, a friend bought a real cheap place to fix up, and it hadn't been touched, and there was problems for sure, but the structure was fine. Interesting. And 200, 300 years old. How, how did you get set up with this internship over there? And mm. I, I, maybe I interrupted your story, but you were have been programming and, and then you kind of oh, got yeah. fed up with that. And so maybe finish that tale. Okay. So yeah, from there to there is I, um, I found a timber framing company that runs these workshops uh, called EcoNest. Uh, he's actually just here in Ashland, Robert oh. Laporte. And I saw on their tool list, like, this is the tools you need to bring. And it said, like, this specific Japanese chisel. And I was like, this is the one. Um, so I did that in in Ottawa, fell in love with it. I did another multi-week one down in Pennsylvania, Virginia, working on a house there. Multi-week? Yeah, the biggest version is six weeks. Wow, okay. And I he, he had me come back to do a, a little bit of the help with the finished stuff and you were a student with promise yes okay uh, he you know it, you find these people along your way that yeah who like it yeah. really like it and he uh he kind of got me connected with the owner of that house to do the finnish uh japanese elements so he so he had trained with another japanese carpenter and so incorporates these elements into his design and so i did the shoji doors and the tokonoma which is like a little alcove it's kind of like there's no real equivalence in in america it's it's a a little place where you put like a bonsai or a scroll and then there's shelving and stuff yeah like a a niche yeah like a teeny shrine kind of yeah it's where you show off your few very nice possessions to your guests in the in the receiving room i guess yeah it's like the nicest room of the house so in the in kitsch america would be it's the it's the soffit over your kitchen cabinets with some indirect lighting from the bottom but behind there is just <laughs> raw osb with sheetrock dust no it's there's the, it's a fluorescent tube that shines off the it's ceiling the built in where your tv is <laughs> that, well yeah, what's funny yeah, is yeah, yeah. after some negotiations i i there is a, a hidden uh projection screen that comes down nice which you know that's there's balances to be struck between yeah. the, the tradition and, you know, yeah. the client wants this. And you go, yeah. you, but yeah. so that was a huge opportunity and that gave me some stuff for the portfolio. Hmm. And I, I thought at that point, like I can make a living doing this. Just kind of switch away from the, from the, all the technical stuff I was doing and started soliciting for commission woodwork and random stuff here and there. And hmm. kind of in the lulls between that is where the hot tub happened. Because mm. when you're starting out, it's it's hard to do furniture making and any woodwork oh. uh, to make a living. Oh. Fortunately, my my very nice wife has a more normal job. Yay! <laughs> but uh, so you you have you can fully speak to that like uh, a a desk white collar programming you know brain yeah. job and the satisfaction and stability and whatever that brings, <laughs> and then working with your hands, which is. Definitely see, sounds nice, and it is in a lot of ways. But now that you can, now that you've been on both sides, how do you, uh, how do you feel about that kind of? I it's don't know. it's hard. Like anybody that anybody that doesn't say they think several times a year that oh, maybe they should just get another job. Maybe they should just get a real job. Yeah, I should just yeah, I could just spend time with the kids in the evening. Mm-hmm. Everybody, everybody who does it for themselves thinks about that because you have to have this like a little bit of risk aversion where you're, you're saying, I don't know when the next, I don't know where the next money's coming from. And th- think- no, you have to have risk tolerance. Oh yeah. That's what I mean. Yeah. yeah. You have to be risk tolerant. Yeah, risk tolerance. Yes. Like, and fortunately there's, if you can ignore the scary times, you know, yeah. then, yeah. and, and, and there's a variety of experiences, but so many people now are, are at home and they want their house worked on or They want a little project that everybody I know that builds is, is slammed it's a boom this is it's feast and famine you know you're yeah. just articulating you got to learn to live with your stomach growling yes and you got to learn to eat so much when the feast happens that you can last into the into the famine <laughs> right the problem is 
when the the feasting part is me being like, oh, I can afford to buy a nice yeah. new yeah. tool. Like, yeah, there's a tool. I I'm can... looking like, oh, this I might be able to afford a wood miser if I. I heard you to. talking about a sawmill. You've got to expunge that from your from your. Oh, bank. it's happening. <laughs> okay, now let me let's just speak to that for a second. So we we got to talk about wood because he appreciates wood. He drove from yeah. Boulder, Colorado, to Myrtle Point to buy a bunch of POC, Port Orford cedar, and some looks like some clear fir, tongue and groove in there and yeah. stuff. So I've learned you're talking to a former saw, former sawmill owner. Oh yeah. Okay. There are wood misers in every neighborhood, and those guys will all run them cheap because none of them have figured out any way to make any money with their wood miser. <laughs> and if you could hire your neighbor to come over for seventy bucks an hour and run that wood miser for two days, and then take it home, and you've got the wood. Ah, I'm just saying. Okay. So. Uh, if I wanted to make money, <laughs> <laughs> oh, we're back to that. Yeah. But the thing is, well. I, I mean, I'm ask anybody. I'm a person that wants to do it. I want to, sure. If you want to do it, run, run done right. You got to do it yourself. Sure. I, I delivered my own baby by accident. <laughs> okay, on, wow. On the bathroom floor because of some circumstances. Did you do it right? Did you get it done right? Yeah, she, yay. She, I, it there was, but Man, that is amazing. Jack of all trades, king of all trades. <laughs> people, people were like, "Oh yeah, of course he did." <laughs> of course, yeah. Because uh, that's <laughs> and and also I love the idea of sure. the tool and and. Being able to select exactly the cuts and getting a, a big port offered log, and because sometimes you want a really big door panel on the bottom sure. that's a complete middle of the tree type of thing. Sure, it's good luck finding a sawmill that's going to cut you a, a. No, but you bring him portable. He comes over and you yeah. call the shots. You've got your your keels in your hand. You mark the cuts. You say, hey, "Turn it, okay. Turn it a little more, okay. Dog it down, cut there." <laughs> you get. All, I, I'm. If if it's sawmill glory you want, you've got to build a circular mill, man. I there's mean, wood a, misers are just. I mean, they're great. Yeah, but, there's uh, a guy in uh, you. in Boulder that is a character, and he has built his own monstrosity uh -huh. compound with a circular mill, and it's a it's a sight to behold. But yeah, mm. yeah, I'm somewhere somewhere between <laughs> just wanting to be able to kind of do do my own thing with that. No, like, I get it. Get I enough get land it. with enough trees that I can build, you know, a shop, mill my own wood, yeah. put the paneling. So, what's the deal with Port Orford cedar? How's that worth a trip as opposed to some other type of cedar more local to Colorado? So, oh, well, for one, there's not really much cedar local to Colorado. There's, oh. there's like Ponderosa and Lodgepole. And it's naughty. And and mm -hmm. they this pergola that I got it for, um, the... The original stuff was all rotted out from the, the freeze thaw and it was sealed wrong and it was so crazy how rotted it was like it just flaked apart yeah just grab it and tear out handful which you'd think in such a dry place as colorado but, but it was pine it was probably pine had to be pine. some sort of pine yeah, yeah pine's pine's paper yeah and, and i actually wonder like side note if if like the sealant on the bottom that didn't burn off held the water held in the water. or something mm -hmm. i don't know uh, but anyway, um, Port Orford. Yeah, Port. <laughs> I could talk all day long. Port Orford is very similar to the Japanese hinoki, oh. which is there. It's a very common wood over there. They have sugi and hinoki, and that sugi is their cedar, Japanese cedar, and mm. hinoki is the cypress. I think it's a cypress too, which is which is closely related to a cedar mm -hmm. generally, mm -hmm. right? And um, so much of the Port Orford has been exported from here to, to Japan. Really? They call it, they have a funny name for it, American Hinoki or something like that. Yeah. I guess it's not that because of color and the, and the tightness of the grain, but the tech, the kind of the feel of the white. Yes. It's just creamy, white, uniform, and similar to their wood. It, just, and so their wood was kind of sacred to them, right? At one point, I mean, the stuff in the temples, I think, was there for, I don't know. I know nothing, but... <laughs> But I've I've read things that make me think. Whoa, whoa, they really hold this stuff in high regard. Well, the the I mean, the whole Shinto faith is based on a sort of a reverence for nature. Yeah, among mm -hmm. some other things, and and yeah, they it, it, they do ceremonies with the trees. Uh, there's a whole religious festival where they ride one of these massive trees. Everybody gets drunk, sits on the tree, and they try to ride it down the mountain. Mm -hmm. People get hurt. Mm. Um, and yeah, the government maintains big plots of perfect old growth old growth for ma continuous maintenance of the temple Interesting. Yeah, on an island you think like historically you know their resources they they knew exactly 
how finite they were. Yeah, you huh. know, like this is our forest, so it would make sense that they would treat each beam with a lot of respect. You know, like yeah. Yeah. you can't just toss it and yeah. import a new one from China. Yeah, I mean, maybe, maybe <laughs> they did actually. From but... China. Well, they they had been they take, <laughs> importing they it from Taiwan because yeah. um, they were running out. But yeah, it's. Yeah, there's a weird, there's always, uh, Japan is like, you know, they always say it's like a nation of contradictions. There's always yeah. this like, yeah. very, let's, you know, conserve everything, but then they have a temple that they rebuild every 20 years. Really? From the ground up. Yeah. Interesting. As for like uh, rebirth and stuff. Huh. Interesting. Yeah. And uh, It's got to be the most different culture from, I don't know, our own or maybe from every other culture. It's, it's another just... planet. So do you, are you familiar with Dan Carlin, Hardcore History? Yeah, yeah, I love him. All right, so he's got one on Japan and, oh and, and their ascension. Oh, my goodness. And his quote, I don't know if it was his or someone else's, that Japan is like everyone else, only more so, which is an interesting sort of a way to describe that. You know, whatever other people do, Japan really does it. They're, they're yeah. very good at, I mean, they're, they're good at lots of things natively, but yes. one thing that it strikes you is they will take something that somebody else has done yeah. and take it to a level that you can't even believe. Yeah. Name your game, they will beat you Audio, at Audio, yeah. mm-hmm. tools. Toyota. Toyota. Yeah. I mean, it. you know, Kubota, you got a Kubota. Sure, sure. It's like er- everything. And uh, yeah. man, I wish I, I wish I had my tools with me. I'd show you this circular saw. You'd, you'd fall in I off. would love to see it. So let's talk about, so, so he and I have been first emailing and then texting because he's coming over. To, I didn't know where East Fork Lumber was. It's in Myrtle Point, which oh. is what, 65 miles west of here or something Yeah, over towards the coast. And so during the day, he's, he's texted me a few times. I think, well, this guy's determined. Okay, great. You know, I got a little slack. So then I, I called you or something. And anyhow, so he texted me tonight and he was in the parking lot of Oregon Tool getting his bearings. Oh, he cool. Said. <laughs> so so I, I got over there and I pulled up and he's got this F-250 Six years newer than mine. Six or seven years. 2000. 2000, like yeah. Three years. Okay, so, three years newer yeah, than mine. Mine's a 97. Yours is in better shape. And he's got a utility box on it. He's got a full length lumber rack. And he's got how many? Are those 10 by 10s? I think they're, yeah, I think they're 10 by 10s or eight by 12. Aren't they square? They look eight by 12, maybe. They're big. Yeah, they're big. They're eight by 12, Port Orford Cedar, 18 and 20 feet long. And his rack is stacked full of them. They're hanging over four and aft. Wow. About 900 pounds worth up there. Mm. Nice wood. A couple of them are free of heart center, yeah. tight grain. And then he's got this trailer just jammed. I think <laughs> this guy appreciates <laughs> wood. He's not so afraid. Cool. <laughs> he's not afraid to strike out on his own to get some at home, man. Well, I really wanted to meet the lumber yard guy because he was referred to me by one of my teachers. Huh. And uh I in I mean, I because I've I was in Japan nine months before COVID really hit, a lot of my stories come from that but there there is a lot of, to say about they have such the relationship is k- killer there yeah you will not buy wood from anybody but your guy like a loyalty yeah there's extreme loyalty up through the whole chain so it wow. impressed upon me a little bit and it was nice to be like you know i'm gonna go get this wood like save a couple grand on shipping maybe we'll see if yeah. i make it home it's got to get shipped one way or the other. Yeah. Like one way or the other, you're paying for shipping. I want to put a name to a face. Yeah. The the front desk lady that I, I'm sure was sick of me at many times. <laughs> when I was, this going to be ready? This gonna be ready. <laughs> it was cool to you know meet her. Do and, they have, a, how often do people travel to get their lumber at this mill? Is that, it can't be Everybody seemed surprised that I had <laughs> really? traveled there, yeah. especially from Boulder. Um, but they ship, they ship overseas yeah. and very few people seem to be able to get Port Orford now. Wow. In in that quality level. Did, what's the deal with cedar in general? Does it just kind of grow in more wet places? Is that and that's part of why it just is good at lasting longer in general? It is so, always so, resisting so mold. I don't know if it's the wet feet, because hemlock also grows in wet places uh-huh. and is not spectacularly rot resistant. Uh-huh. But cedar and redwood and cypress and actually white oak uh-huh. is rot resistant. Yeah, and I don't know what else would be really rot resistant coming locust, out. Locust, I think. Locust, probably. Osage orange. I've heard that they make fence posts out of that in the Midwest. They make fence posts out of Osage. orange? How about orange? that? <laughs> but but I'm sure it's second growth. You know. Yeah. You know now anyway. I've I've I have nailed down lots of two by six decking on decks around middle mid level houses with second growth Port Orford cedar. Wow. Like lots. The problem is it just turns into the dirtiest shade of gray you ever saw so fast. You know. Yeah, I'm a little worried about this because. They really like the new wood look, and that's probably why they got it sealed. Uh-huh. But I'll try to work my magic. 
I yeah. mean, th- that wood is beautiful because it's, it's, it doesn't, it doesn't last forever. It, yeah. it has its lifespan. Yeah. If it's a tree, then it becomes a thing and it, it ages and patinas. And yeah. mm-hmm. you go into these houses in Japan and the, because of the fires and the age, the cedar posts are black, basically. Uh-huh. Yeah. They're gorgeous. Yeah. What fires? Like they're fire for heat, you mean? Yeah. Traditional Smoke. houses, uh, country houses, there's sort of a central sunken fireplace. The smoke went up into the rafters like so, not in the chimney or anything it just mm-hmm. just up just like it like you're in a teepee like a teepee yeah yeah wow and, and um in many cases they'd they'd raise silkworms in the upper floors and i guess oh. that the heat helped it also the that's what's so interesting like back to that concrete enclosure thing they had a form that was self-contained and self-sustaining this they had thatched roof with rice straw the smoke kept the bugs from living in the thatched roof yeah once they meddle over the roofs, which was another trend, now then there's a trillion horrifying bugs in the houses, yep. in the yep. farmhouses. Yep. Yeah, spiders wow. this big. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Gedgy Gedgy, what is that? It's centipede. a centipede that's this long. Oh, like, oh, nice. In your roof, like falling down. Yeah, falling you, down between your eyes at night. Yeah. yeah, and the spiders run. They don't. Yeah. They run at you fast. But smoke. Keep yeah. them all out. Yeah. But th- so that that uh, form is kind of disintegrated. Huh. Yeah, you actually sleep in these little these little um, <laughs> almost like uh, mosquito net tents mm-hmm. in a country house. You put your futon in there huh. because you don't want those things creeping on you at night. Yeah. Wow. So that was uh, that was an interesting. Sp- now, so now there's not a bug in the states that that bothers me. <laughs> a they- spider this big <laughs> will walk her in the and I'm like whatever. Are they pr- are they quite prideful about their carpentry and craftsmanship there? Do they hmm. do they kind of visualize the Japanese trade as you know the best there is, or or did that's that, a good did you question? Notice? You know, it's not so much amongst sort of the I don't know the modern generation. I guess yeah. it's kind of like what is it like? There's like you know the small. I guess you could call them like hipster, the sort of the like artistic youth yeah. has found a trendiness in that, yeah. you know, back to basics in urban lumberjack. Yeah. Yeah. And they, that's come a little from the States. The, the normal office worker appreciates it, but doesn't understand yeah. in a way. And I think this is just across the board, really skilled craftsmen are intelligent always and intelligent enough to know that their methods and techniques work for, where they are kind of and mm-hmm. it's almost like the the sub tier of mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. craftsmen who are smug enough to think mm-hmm. that they should do it this way in <laughs> yeah. over here you know yeah. or maybe that's just youtube commenters but <laughs> i i'm i'm not surprised that you know japanese people are just sort of not overthinking you know the way they do it and yeah i'm sure there's individuals with different views on that but it's uh you know it's it, you have to educate the client in, yeah. in, in every aspect and, and the higher end stuff, you know, it's like the, for, it's impossible to sell furniture in America. Everybody buys it from Ikea. Yeah. 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 You got to say, well, yeah, this is a $3,000 little credenza yeah. because me and some other people or whatever, I got to get the lumber. I got to yeah. mill the lumber. Yeah. I gotta and get because the you cannot buy one like this on the whole surface of the yeah. planet. This is the only one of these. Yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a soul is in that. Yeah, yeah, it'll take you know just the time. I mean, I think once people once that clicks, I've even had to like do this math in my head of it'll take someone uh, 180 hours mm-hmm. to do this job. Let's say it's like blacksmithing something, like a sword yeah, yeah, or something. Yeah, it's kind of mm. like cool sword. How much? Five thousand bucks. What? What? And what? that's the first reaction. Then it's kind of like yeah, it, it's gonna take 200 plus hours. Yeah. And then you do a little bit of math, and you're like. <laughs> Oh, well, that guy works cheap. Yeah, right. Exactly. exactly. Yeah. yeah. Oh, jeez. Yeah. My accounting <laughs> software sometimes is. Oh, well, that was a disaster. <laughs> yeah. Well, that is really cool. So th- let's maybe tell us about this. The project. Are you gonna make a video about the uh, where the pergola. logs are going? The pergola. Yeah. I. You know this. Things happen for a reason. I think this has obviously restarted my funk of YouTube that has ha- probably been since my daughter was born. Um. I've been planning on filming a lot of this stuff and I'll, I'll definitely, uh, we, we filmed the demo of the old one Yeah, and uh, all the projects I've been kind of keeping up on the film. I haven't done yeah. serials. I've been still trying to find my voice, you know, like, yeah. And, uh, well, we'll get, we'll, we'll link to, um, all of these videos, especially the hot tub one that we mentioned, <laughs> but we definitely understand that whole, yeah. 
that making the videos just adds God so much work to it. Do you are you editing them and kind of he doing is. all that yourself so too? It's one one man shop here. Yeah, I uh, I just I just brought in a guy that works with me a couple of days a week to help me with a bunch of stuff, and that was that's helpful, but you know, maybe it would have been better to find somebody that was that did everything that he does plus video. Yeah, <laughs> but Boy, then then that. you start you're paying somebody to do the video, and mm-hmm. it that the ec- economics of it aren't. It's more just sharing what yeah. I know and what I've learned yeah. and stuff at this point. Yeah. 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 Well, that is too cool. Well, hey, can't thank you enough for stopping by and uh, sharing yeah. your your insight on this. It's Japanese carpentry. It's like I've never really paid close enough attention, but you just know it's always kind of there yeah. when you know when you yeah. see it. Yeah. And it's always kind of like, yeah. Wow. I. How do they do how that? How do they do that? How do they? And I always think, how do they afford that too? Kind of. There like, is that. It's just. And and I I really enjoyed your comment about for for a certain level of Japanese carpenter, he's got to produce some work. There's mm-hmm. expectations of productivity there, yeah. not just our perceived expectation of a of a supernatural product. Yeah. But there's dog on it. We got there's a certain amount of work we've got to get it done today, boys. Fast yeah. is as important as quality there. Okay, so that's a beautiful comment. Like like anybody can spend all day, yes, poking at their kana to get the perfect uh, uh-huh. Japanese plane to get the perfect like bed, okay, or sharpening. Yes, no, you got to sharpen in two minutes. Yeah, and get back to work. See, that's a beautiful way. To, one of my little axioms that people that if it ticks people off sometimes that is you can take if you give anybody enough time and enough <laughs> material, they can make something perfect. Yeah. Okay. And so the essence of craftsmanship, at least one way to look at it, is to make something as perfect as it needs to be for the person who's buying it with the right amount of material in the right amount of time or just a little less, Mm -hmm. you know, and not many people can do that. Yeah. It's tough because everybody can see the perfect job and that's like in everybody's face. Like, that's a good job and this is what you did, but nobody can see how fast the guy got it done or how many of those he did that day. If they could, it would look a lot more like <laughs> level like, up. Like choose, ah, which one do I, which one do I want? But <laughs> yeah. you can't see how productive the guy was who's isn't as good. So that's right. Um, so to, to answer your question, finally about the how to get the apprenticeship. Yeah. Right. So like I was doing this hot tub, and there's a there's a woodworkers meetup. Uh, there's one in San Francisco, and there's one in New York area called a uh, Kez Kazurokai, which is it's named after the Japanese planing competition where they make these plane shavings that are like a blood cell thick. I mean, it's, it's crazy. Huh. Um, and that's put on by another teacher of mine, uh, Jan Giger. Uh, and then there's a different organization that does the West coast. Anyway, I went there after doing a short trip in Japan, like a solo trip. And my teacher who ended up being my teacher and his, like second in command. So uh, Yamamoto san and John were there to participate. Yeah. And they had heard through other friends that oh, this, this kid just came back from Japan. He was just there for six weeks, like messing around, trying to find his own way. Uh-huh. And uh, I, we, I hit it off with them and, and but they were like, yeah, we're thinking maybe people should come out here and work with us. And I was oh, like, I so cool. will do that. They're like, well, you know, let's put it, let's open it up to everybody. And, and like, just no, so, <laughs> it's happening. And then, and, and we got the visa worked out. Wow. And, so it was more like you saw an opportunity and then you snatched it yeah, and jumped. That's on awesome. It. That yeah. is too cool. And that in and of itself is a, is a pretty cool, I don't know yeah. about lesson, but example, that's really, cool. it is that, that really, so that's it. Well, good luck on this trip back to Boulder. Thank you. <laughs> I mean, you, you got to nurse that truck that is overloaded about as far as you ought to overload a truck. How, what are you're still like 1800 miles from home? It's uh, it's like 1,200, I 1200 think. 1,200 miles from home and every inch is uphill, right? Yeah, Mile High City, right? It's got to be. Gotta... It's every inch is uphill <laughs> and some portion is going to be covered with snow and ice. Man, I'm a little worried about you, okay? I'll, I'll check in. Yeah, <laughs> please do. All right, well, thanks for coming on, Jason. Thanks and everybody, so much. Thanks for listening and we'll catch you next time. Thanks. <laughs>